Well, good evening. You may turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6, which is always a good jumping off point when we talk about Christian education. Any students that have taken Christian education courses in the college, of course, they've memorized these passages in Deuteronomy chapter 6, especially where it deals with the training of the children. But pastor asked me to speak uh, uh, this evening on the value of Christian education. And as we look around and we see how quickly things are changing, uh, and for me being, as I always say, an old head, been around for a while, I've seen the changes and they're coming on very, very quickly. And it's just amazing. There's things that are being taught and things that are being brought up and things that are being promoted that I, I don't have a full understanding of even yet. And uh, we won't be able to cover all of those things, but we'll cover some that I think will be helpful to us uh, this evening. So I appreciate the opportunity uh, to bring this message to you. Let me have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word, and Lord, it's you and you working in uh, through your word. And I pray now, Lord, you'll meet with us tonight. Lord, help us to be attentive to the things that are being brought forth. And Lord, let the power of your word uh, pierce our hearts and Lord, make a difference. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. So if you had Deuteronomy chapter 6, I'll begin in verse 4. And the Bible says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, we see in those first three verses that I have read, he's not just talking about children. He's talking about everybody. So this applies to us, even as adults. Uh, we need to be moving forward in our Christian education. The church is here uh, to educate us in the Word of God, through the preaching of the Word of God. We have the Bible. We're so blessed that we all have Bibles in our homes that we can study the Word of God. But we have a Canadian Baptist Bible College. And I'm not here to promote the college, but we can even take classes and such to, be, to continue our Christian education because that's important as we live on this earth. But so in these first three verses, we see that it's applicable to all of us. And he says, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Then he goes on to say this, the Lord says, And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. And what he's saying here, God is saying in the, in the home and where we go and as we uh, uh, commune with people, the Word of God should be being brought up. It should be being discussed. We should be uh, focused on the, the Almighty God that has given us the wonderful salvation that we have. And of course, the passage does make it quite clear that uh, the parents are entrusted by God with the role of educating their children and specifically educating them in the values of God, or we can call it Christian education. There is nothing more important than bringing our children up in the Lord and directing and training them to live by godly principles. And the most important for them to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. You know, parents, uh, we can change our careers every couple of years, every four or five years. Uh, maybe we can move from one place to another place, buy another house, move over here, move to another location, uh, uh, get uh, repositioned. Uh, we can participate in various ministries of the church and maybe change that ministry and go to another ministry. Uh, but the, the one thing that parents only have one opportunity to, to do, and that is to, uh, to accomplish the raising of their children in the Lord with a Christian education. There's a cliche uh, that has a lot of wisdom in it, and it says simply this, that when a person has come to the end of their life and they're on their deathbed, they don't sit back and they're going through their regrets and they don't regret not spending more time at the office. They don't regret not making more money. Many times as Christians, we regret that we did not do better with our children. Or we regret that we did not do better for the Lord. Marlon Detweiler 
I made a great observation, and I'm going to read it to you. It says this, it, is, it was once understood that theology was the queen of sciences. Theology was the queen of sciences. As spokes extend from the hub of a wheel, so all disciplines tie together in God Himself. God created all things. Everything is, is, is his, his creation. So it's all tied together and it all revolves around God. He says, when we say Christian education, we should mean sound biblical teaching in and for all of our lives. To love God with all our heart, soul, and soul, mind, and strength. And as we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6, God t- tells us that. And to love our neighbor as ourselves is what Christ taught us as the greatest of the commandments. Disciplining our minds, our brains, according to God's Word, is not as simple as memorizing Bible verses. Applying Scripture to all of life is no simple task. Rigorous study has always preceded Christian maturity. Jonathan Edwards, one of the greater pastors and philosophers in North America, was known to study and pray 13 13 hours a day every day. And we sort of live a life where we have sort of a neatly packaged Christianity where we kind of get it all at the convenience store. Well, I'll get all that I need. We come to church and I sit through three services and I'll get everything I need there. Or we have sort of an add Christ to your life type of Christianity. But that's not biblical Christianity. Biblical Christianity is maturing as a Christian and studying to know the Word of God. Just being saved is not Christian maturity. Christian education is an ongoing process that never ceases in life if we truly want to be what the Lord wants us to be. Today, education throughout North America has taken a great downturn. In education, by not mentioning God, and they've taken God as far away as they can, especially Jesus Christ. They'll allow other religions, they'll allow other types of God to be spoken of, but they don't want to hear the name of Jesus Christ. They do not want to see the Bible in our educational facilities. By not mentioning God, the implication is that God is not relevant in life. You see the philosophy that's that's being cultured. Uh, If we don't mention God, then He's not relevant. Yet He's relevant in every, every aspect of life. Again, because He is the Creator and He maintains all that we have. We have heard the well-rehearsed statement, we follow the science. Well, we follow the science. Well, God created the science, and you better be, <clears throat> be right, and you better be truthful if you're going to follow the science, because it's God's science, and we can't take credit for it. The destructive philosophies that inundate the higher education, and even in our K-12 through schools, can easily be refuted and corrected by Scriptural truth. The most destructive part of non-Christian teaching is the subtle lies taught about the character of God. If God is not being taught, then if God is brought up, He is being evil surmised. They're making up things they do not even know for which they speak of. Our loving, forgiving, grace-bearing God who gave his life for us, is brought out to be a bigot, to be unloving, to be unforgiving, to be uncaring, or just a non-existent being. We can't allow that to happen, but it's happening now. You just read the news, and you see the things that are being taught and the battles that are being fought, because some people are, are, are coming awake, not so much as they're fighting for God, but just some of the things are so unreasonable that are being taught to children. It's unbelievable. 
teaching that is unbiblical and being under a constant exposure to teaching that is un, unbiblical begins to cause a person to begin to think as an atheist would think. You know, Jesus dealt with this biblical principle in Luke chapter 6, verses 39 and 40. In verse 39, the Bible says this, And he spake a parable unto them, Can the blind lead the blind? Shall they not both fall into the ditch? In other words, if the blind are going to lead the blind, they're all going down the road to failure. They're all going down to, going down to the same ditch. They're all going to fall into the same ditch. Then he goes on in verse 40 and says this, The disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be as his master. If we allow ourselves to be uh, exposed to and be a part of the wrong type of education, and then the Bible says that we will, when we get that education, we're going to be just like the master, the one that taught us that education. He says, the disciple is not above his master, but everyone that is perfect shall be or mature. He's learned the material that's being taught shall be as his master. Being trained in places where as a matter of their principles, Christ is not to be taught or brought forth as Lord of all things and creator of all things will cause one to doubt the true greatness, the true greatness of our God and the true greatness and wonderful salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the battle that God addresses in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 and 5. When he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. God's doctrines are pure. God's doctrines are pure, are, 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 are true. They come from God, and they lead us to God. And He accompanies those doctrines and those truths with His power to work on our hearts to those that hear them, and to tear down those things that the devil would put into our hearts, those strongholds that he would bring into our hearts, <coughs> uh, to cause us to fall away and turn away from Him, and to live lives that are reprobate and unkind, and where we don't get along, and, 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 and there's division and there's strife. It's what the devil wants. Satan seeks avenues to weaken our faith. How many people suffer mental anguish and stress, even depression, because they are not spiritually stable? Satan has flooded their minds with doubts concerning God, the same as he deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, Eden bringing doubt to God's Word. We are bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's a benefit. That's a value of Christian education. Those thoughts include our mathematical thoughts. God created math. Algebra too. I'm sorry for some of you. <laughs> and He didn't do it to be hurtful to you. <laughs> and it does have a purpose. Mathematical thoughts, our science thoughts, our English thoughts, even English, our biology thoughts, our history thoughts, and on and on we can go. God is intermingled in all of that because God created all of that. We didn't create that. We just discovered what God had already created. We do not know all things, so we find something such as 2 plus 2 is 4. Woo! <laughs> A great scientific discovery. Can I get some kind of uh, financing so I can go further from 2 plus 2 to 2 plus 6 or something like that? Get some sort of government funding. I'm being silly here. But, uh, <clears throat> but we only undercover, uh, uncover that which God has already created and God has already set in order. That's why we have to have a Christian education. Because everything around here, everything we study, everything we learn about, everything that the scientists teach us, everything the doctors, uh, where they have, they, they have made, made these discoveries, were all things that God created. 
God is orderly. And because of his orderly systems, man can discover in advance when the sun will rise and set, when the stars and moon will be on any given, where they will be on any given day or night of the year. But man only discovers what God already knows. God is logical in his thoughts. <coughs> as long as our thoughts line up with his thoughts, they're logical also. Logical means to be able to recognize false reasoning, false reasoning. You know, you can say, you can look and say, oh, look, there's a young man. He has two legs. Look there, there's a goose. The goose has two legs. Oh, so logically, if the goose has two legs and the young man has two legs, then the goose is a young man and the young man is a goose. They both have two legs. <laughs> That's a little bit silly, but it's along the same lines when we get into some of the philosophies that are being taught and the directions that are being <coughs> carried, carried on in education. They both have two legs, yet... <coughs> By other clear distinction, distinctions, the young man is not a goose, and the goose is not a young man. Knowing the word of the creator of the goose and the young man help in understanding logically what is right. God created things after their own kind. There is a distinction, there is a difference and God distinguishes between His creatures. That's why it's important that we know the Word of God and that we know God and that we are saved and have that relationship. Logic originates with God. It is an expression of His unchanging, orderly, truthful character. God is logical in His thoughts and our logic is valid only so far, far as it is a reflection of God's logic. And how are we going to have a reflection of God's logic in our life if we're not getting a good Christian education? The value of Christian education. He is not a God of disorder. He is not a God of deception. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says this, For God is not the author of confusion. But what is the author of? Peace as in all churches of the saints. And of course, he's dealing with issues in the church. That's the principle. God is the author of peace. But what do we see around us? We see young people coming out of universities, young people coming out of high schools, and we see adults even uh, that have been through that worldly type system. And what do we see? We see anger, we see bitterness, we see this, this evil, we see burning down places and you say, why is this all going on? Because we've allowed Satan to have so much input in society. God is orderly. God's word is truth. John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God is orderly. God is truth. As long as we can have the truth, we can know all the facts and understand everything. Also, God cannot lie. Hebrews 6, verses 17 and 18 says this, Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of His counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible, impossible for God to lie. God is orderly. God is truth. God cannot lie. My soul, what do we live in today, a society? Lying, 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 lying. As long as we accomplish, the ends justify the means. Lying, lying, lying. Why is there so much confusion out there? When we saw the things that went on politically, and the people that represent us in Parliament got up there and immediately without any true facts or information began bellowing out lie after lie after lie. 
lack of Christian education. God does not deny himself. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Our God is orderly. Our God is truth. Our God cannot lie. And our God does not deny himself. He is the almighty God. God is, and he can never be in the smallest degree, anything contradictory to or falling beneath the level of his own consistent and uniform self. As God, he must be true to the character of goodness and wisdom which the very name of God brings with it, and which the very name of our Lord Jesus Christ, and do not be ashamed to say the name of Jesus Christ. Young people and all of us are surrounded by a media that's militantly attacking biblical virtues and values. The goal of Christian education is to, to present every man perfect in Christ. But the postmodernism declares that there is no right way to live. In the midst of all this conflict, many Christians are surrendering, lowering their standards and their commitment to Christ. Colossians 1.28 says this, Whom we preach, warning every man, and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ. Many unsaved parents and many adults only desire the high academic standard that is found as, as various schools promote their high academic standard, but not a spiritual principled education. The Bible speaks of tutors and speaks of governors in their children's lives. And of course, parents cannot teach everything, so they have to go to tutors and governors. In Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from the servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. The father's in control. Parents, we need to control. We need to make sure. We need to guide and put in those, those fail-safes. When our children are off the school, uh, uh, that, that they're still active in church, and they're, they're still at, active at home, and they're, they're still not being left off to themselves. Students may need to go to special, specialists for training, accounting, engineering, music, chemistry, but in that practice, the father is still the ultimate authority who protects the student from the worldly philosophies that are taught and the student is active in Christ's service and not one easily you know, to be led to follow worldly deception and philosophy. So, sort of introduction there, but we're wanting to address, and we cannot cover all of them as I said earlier, and my time is running short, <coughs> But in secular education, they're emphasizing a lot of things that we need to be very fearful of. And I'm going to just address one, and that's gender identification. Gender identification. I'm sure you've heard of that. Now, with a biblical Bible education, we know it's a settled deal. God is orderly, God is truth. He cannot lie, and he identified the genders for us. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Now that's the important thing. But then he establishes male and female created he them. So anything beyond that is a direct <coughs> defiance of the fact that we've been created in God's own image. What is happening is what is happening today is what we find in Romans chapter 1. In verse 25, 21 it says this, Because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. And I'm telling you, people out there know more about God than what we think they do. They know a whole lot, whole lot more about God. They've rejected God, but they know there is a God. Because God tells us that. And God's not a liar. 
But they know probably a lot more than what, uh, I'm always surprised when I hear some of these people talk and they understand the Bible. They can quote scripture many times. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into the image, an image made like <coughs> to corruptible man, to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through their lust of their own heart hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served what? The creature more than the creator. Self-worship is what this is. It's self-worship. And I like the way the Lord ends it. The creator, just beyond that, he says, who is blessed forever. Amen. I was reading an article I was doing as I was researching by Laura Meckler in June 3rd of 2022 from the Washington Post. And let me, I'm going to read, I'm not going to have the whole article, but I'll read verbatim uh, some excerpts of it. A lesson meant for first grade called Pink, Blue, and Purple comes from a curriculum called Rights, Respect, Responsibility developed by the activist group Advocates for Youth. It tells students that greater, that gender is not a fixed attribute. You might feel like you're a boy, even if you have body parts <clears throat> that some people might tell you are girl parts, the teachers are told to say. You might feel like a girl, even if you have body parts that some people tell you are boy parts. And you might not feel like you're a boy or a girl, but you're a little bit of both. No matter how you feel, you are perfectly normal. And then she goes on and gives some illustrations. Bill Farmer, a science teacher in Evanston, Illinois, takes a similar approach. Like Long, which was another illustration she gave, he teaches about people with inter intersex traits. Those born with reproductive or sexual anatomy who do not fit the traditional male or female binary. And he introduces the idea that gender is a social construction, not a biological fact. Well, let me tell you something. The Word of God says it's a biological fact. God made them male and female. In a video being used, and this is just something else I found, in a video being used by schools in the state of Maine in the United States, the teacher says that sometimes doctors make a mistake when they tell the parents whether their newborns borns are boys or girls. Now on the counter of that, I found an article in Today's Parenting by a, a Ruwa Sabah in January of 2008, and uh, his article was, or her article was, Acting Like a Dog, How to Cope with Negative Attention-Seeking uh, Behavior. And so the question was brought up, our three-year-old son thinks he's a dog. He barks, howls, eats off the floor, likes to wear a dog leash on his pants to make a tail. He'll eat dog food and dog treats if he can get them. We always <clears throat> ask him to stop. In, and even put him in time out, but it doesn't seem to make a difference. The answer, think back to what was happening a year ago in your family. Was there a big change in your son's life? For example, did you have a new, new baby? Did the primary caregiver go to work after being at home with him? Did he begin a new nursery school? Was the family under stress for another reason? The more you can understand the context of his behavior, in which his behavior began, the more effective you will be in changing it because you will be able to respond to the needs that prompted, prompted him to begin acting like a dog. A boy is not a dog. So appropriately deal with it. They just have to be taught. In another uh, uh, thing from Wel Wellesley University, a psychologist and they, I was reading the article, and they say that it's natural for children to act out different things because they're exploring in their minds. Uh, but they have to be always set back to what is right. God gives parents 
and the church for training responsibility. My parents, though I did not grow up in a, in a church attending religious home, but back at that time, many years ago, even unsaved people or people who were not in church respected there was a God and that He created all things. And I remember one day as a boy, maybe six, I don't know exactly how old I was, and we were driving in our 1955 Ford Town and Country station wagon, and I was in the back seat, my mother was driving, and my sister was in the front seat, I think, and my brother was back with me, and we drove by a woman. And I yelled out the window some rather derogatory statements that had to do with the woman's physical uh, condition and also the woman's race. I was five, six, maybe seven years old at the most. My mother pulled that town and country made in Texas Ford station wagon over. She came over the front seat and smacked me right upside of my head and put her finger in my face, said, do you ever talk like that about anybody? I don't know whether she said she'd kill me or not. <laughs> I will torture you for the next 20 years now. <laughs> you know what? Boing. I'm not, I'm not condoning that her coming across the seat and smacking me across the feet, but I got her point. And I have learned from that. You see, we can, <clears throat> the humanist will say, you were born good. It's society has messed you up. No, I was born a sinner, and I need a mama that has some good sense in her to straighten me out from that sinful nature. We need Christian, that's the value of Christian education. Conservative, conservatives argue that inclusive curriculums pose a special challenge, challenge, challenges. Lessons in school amount to cult grooming and ideological grooming in which students are taught that their gender is fluid and can be changed, said James Lindsay, a conservative activist who has advised legislatures on measures dealing with gender and race. Well, I don't think I, I finished on that, that uh, uh, on the dog, boy being a dog, the, the, the person that was counseling him said, now you need, you need to work at getting him to quit acting like a dog, but if in a few weeks it does not work, this is what he says. He said, if you do not see change in his behavior in a few weeks, consider a consultation with a qualified mental health professional. So here they're saying, you know what, here's a child that needs help because they don't think, he doesn't think he's a boy. Then over here they're saying, here's a child that needs help. We need to help them to realize that though they're a boy, they want to be a girl. So let's help them be a girl because they must be a girl because they think they're a girl. It's all wacko. Maybe I shouldn't use that word, I don't know. The rise in children identifying as transgender or gender non binary he argued, is being driven by a culture that introduces the idea to children who might never have adopted it on their own. Never would have adopted it on their own. Driving down the car, blah, 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 whack. Don't you ever do that again. I adopted what I did on my own. But I had somebody that set, set some parameters. You're not going to do that, young man. <clears throat> The message is, if you dress a certain way, you might not be what you think you are. He said, when I was a child, I wanted to grow up to be a fire truck. Now, how is that going to work? <clears throat> Children do not always exactly know what they're, what's going on in the world, and they need some strong boundaries to protect them. Christian values, the Word of God. Ontario, Ontario Human Rights Commission, I just have some definitions. I don't think I'll go through them because of time, but it deals with gender identity. You can look that up on your own. But let me just say this, the value, the value of Christian education. And let me give you, I believe, six things that are of the value of the Christian education. Number one, the value of Christian education 
is understanding that we need to glorify God. Glorify God. 1 Corinthians 3, 20 through 21. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. Therefore let no man glory in men, for all things are yours. Then the tendency of the, all this philosophy is man glorying in man. But of course, 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Wherefore, whether therefore you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Next, the value of Christian education is learning and fine-tuning to be a servant in the heart and in action. Philippians 2, 5, 8 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion of a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross." And then Matthew 23, 11 says this, But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. And of course, after that, Jesus is dealing with many woes to the Pharisees, scribes, and hypocrites. But he's saying, The greatest among you shall be your servant. The greatest in this group here, the greatest in this group here, are those with the servant's heart. The servant's heart. You won't learn that except through Christian education. Number three, the value of Christian education is learning to pursue holiness. I like this in Mark chapter 6, verse 20. For Herod feared John. Herod, the king, feared John. Now he ultimately was deceived into to killing John, knowing that he was a just man and an holy. That holiness stands out. People are watching us. Are we living a holy life? Or are they seeing us, well, they go to that church, but I know what they're doing over here, and I've seen them do that. He said, but Herod would have known everything about John, and he would have to say, he is a just man, and he is an holy, and observed him. And when he heard him, he did many things, and he heard him gladly. Heard him gladly. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? How are you going to learn that? Except through Christian education. 1 Peter 1, verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. And then number four, the value of Christian education is training to be honest. Training to be honest. Luke 8, 15, it says this. And he's, Jesus is summarizing the, the parable of the, of, of the sower. He says, But that on the good ground are they which are an honest and good heart, having heard the word, keep it, and bring forth fruit with, with patience. An honest and good heart. A person that's, that's sincerely wanting to do right. Chooses to do what is right. When Zacchaeus received Christ, I believe he had an honest, sincere heart, though he was living in sin. <clears throat> but when he began telling Jesus what he was going to do with all the ill-gotten gain he got, then Jesus says, This day salvation has come to this house. 1 Peter 2, 12, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, whereas, that when, that whereas they speak against you as, in the, as evildoers, they may by, by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And of course in Philippians 4, 8, when he says, says think on these sayings, he says, whatsoever is true, what's the second one? And whatsoever is honest, is honest. The value of Christian education is learning to pursue ec excellence in everything we do in life. And I have several verses on that, but I'm going to move ahead. And, in and number six, the value of Christian education is forgiving other people as God forgives us. Eliminating that bitterness and elim eliminating that strife. Of course, Ephesians 4.32 says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. Glorify God. Be a servant. Uh, pursue holiness. Be honest. Pursue excellence in all that we do. And be forgiving. All of those things are the benefits of 
Christian education. We see the undermining of education. The Bible says, A fool hath said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. In Psalms 14.1. Secular humanist education attempts to kill God by eradicating Him from the classroom and from the minds of the next generation. By eliminating the Bible as a basis for all knowledge, humanists remove, remove the very foundation of truth. That's why it's so easy to lie, because nobody believes there's any truth. The very foundation of truth, they prohibit the only objective standard by which reality can be evaluated. Christian colleges and Christian schools encourage a deeper understanding of life and academics. A life with Jesus is a life that is called to go deeper. No matter what a, what a student at a Christian college chooses or a Christian school chooses to study, the most valuable education any student can receive is from the Word of God. <clears throat> That's where the value of Christian education comes, from the Word of God. Biblical and theological courses provide tools to help students to understand uh, the deep biblical principles that God has given to us and it allows us to be more relevant as critical thinkers when we have to deal with subjects from evolution to global ethics to this LGBTQ and never can get it down right issues. Students need to be capable of responsibly engaging with culture while giving well thought out, well thought out reasons from their beliefs from the Word of God. There's great value in Christian education. To think otherwise, to think otherwise, is to be one who is subtly giving credence to the direction that secular education is leading us along. I would rather know Christ, walk with Christ, and serve Christ as effectively as I can than to have a degree on my wall from the most prestigious universities or schools or high schools that we can find in the world. To me, that would be just Nehushtan if that was the most important thing in my life. What is Nehushtan? A piece of brass. When Israel was given the brazen serpent on the pole as a picture of the grace, of the saving grace of Jesus Christ, where they only had to look and be saved from death. Yet the people began to worship it, and God just said, it's Nehushtan. It has no, no more value. Why? Because though it one day pictured that saving grace, it's now longer being worshipped for something other than that. That's where secular education is going. It's taken God out, and all the things that are there to bring us to Christ are being cast aside. It's all become Nehushtan. When our schools, K through 12, our colleges, our universities took God out, they became just Nehushtan. Let me ask you this this evening, do you value Christian education? We need to take it very, very seriously. Does that mean we don't get an education? No, but we need to be wise in how we search out an education. And again, I'm not trying to promote Canadian Baptist Bible College, but we look back at Deuteronomy chapter 6, and uh, uh, why not take classes that are promoting Christian education? Are we living up to the standards of Deuteronomy chapter 6? Are, from the time we rise up throughout the day, is the, the Word of God on our doorpost? Are we speaking it as we go about everywhere we go? You have church, praise the Lord. You have a great church. What do we have? We have Sunday school, preaching, and then preaching, and then preaching. And then we reverse, repeat the cycle. We need to have and be pursuing a Christian education. Why? Because there is value in Christian education.